seems like we live in a day when patriotism is in decline. I make no apologies for being a patriot pastor. I'm a, I'm a patriot. I love this country, and I'm going to do all I can to continue for this country moving in the right direction. Amen? This morning's sermon uh, is from Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 5 and following. You see, I have the acknowledgement on the screen in the bulletin. I do give acknowledgements this morning to the Reverend Dr. O.S. Hawkins, uh, whom I got um, a lot of the material for this sermon from, and I never want to preach a sermon that was inspired by someone else is without giving proper due and proper credit there. Once you find Jeremiah chapter 8, Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 5, if you are able, will you stand with me again as we honor God in the reading of His Word? I know we've stood many times this morning, but we honor God's Word above all the other things. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 5. I'm going to read through verse 7 for our opening text. Hear the Word of the Lord. Why have these people turned away? Why is Jerusalem always turning away? They take hold of deceit. They refuse to return. I paid careful attention. They do not speak what is right. No one regrets his evil asking, what have I done? Everyone has stayed his course like a horse rushing into battle. Even storks in the sky know their seasons. Turtle doves. Swallows and cranes are aware of their migration, but my people do not know the requirements of the Lord. May God and His blessing to the reading, the preaching, and your hearing to understand His holy word. May our Lord Jesus Christ forever be praised, and all of God's people say, Amen. You may be seated. Today is part of our service of worship of Almighty God, and let there be no mistake, this is not an America service, this is a God service, but part of our service, we, we give thanks and, and we remember uh, the celebration coming up this week on July 4th, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the birth certificate of our nation, the official birthday of the United States of America. And we should never forget that those who signed their names to that document, those who put their names at the bottom of that document that said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that when they signed that and they sent it to King George, they were essentially signing their death certificate. They were committing treason. They were signing the document that was saying that their homes would be bur burned. Their farms would be taken over. Their lives would be killed and, and taken. That their whole family would be scattered. They were signing away everything of this earth that they had for the sake of liberty and freedom. This morning, I want us to think about those men who signed the Declaration of Independence. I I'm going to read their names. Because, imagine if you made such a sacrifice in the founding of a nation, and then hundreds of years later they've completely forgotten about who you were. That's not right. That's not right, is it? Those who signed that document were John Adams, Samuel Adams, Josiah Bartlett, Carter Braxton, Charles Carroll, Samuel Chase, Abraham Clark, George Clymer, William Ellery, William Floyd, Benjamin Franklin, Elbridge Geary, Button Gwinnett, John Hancock, Lyman Hall, Benjamin Harrison, John Hart, Joseph Hughes, Thomas Hayward Jr., William Hooper, Stephen Hopkins, Francis Hopkins, Samuel Huntington, Thomas Jefferson, Francis Lightfoot Lee, Richard Henry Lee, Francis Lewis, Philip Livingston, Thomas Lynch, Jr., Thomas McKeon, Arthur Middleton, Lewis Morris, Robert Morris, John Morton, Thomas Nelson, Jr., William Pacha, John Penn, Robert Tree Payne, George Reed, Caesar Rodney, George Ross, Benjamin Rush, one of my favorite signers, 
Edward Rutledge, Roger Sherman, James Smith, Richard Stockton, Thomas Stone, George Taylor, Charles Thompson, Matthew Thornton, George Walton, William Whipple, William Williams, James Wilson, John Witherspoon, Oliver Wolcott, and George White. We owe a debt of gratitude to these men, and may we never Forget them. Amen? These signers of that document that was put on a boat to England, that was declaring the birth of a new nation that they had to defend with their own blood. These men, if, if they stepped off of the pages of history today, and they walked the streets of the United States of America on June 30th, 2019, what what these founders think of our nation today. That's what was on my mind and heart the last several weeks in the preparation of this sermon. When they saw the, the state of the families in our nation today, what would they say? And when they see the, the state of our schools, that children have to walk through metal detectors before going to classrooms, and when they maybe sat in some of the classrooms and saw the behavior that is allowed in a classroom. What would, what would Benjamin Franklin, what would Thomas Jefferson, what would John Witherspoon, what would they say when they heard some of the things being taught in our classroom? What would they say when they saw the crime reports and, and the thieving and the um, abductions and the kidnappings and all of the crimes that go on in our nation, what would these founding fathers say if they, perchance, saw a newspaper article that talked about the national debt? Twenty-one trillion, trillion with a T. What would they say when they found the fact that infanticide, the killing of babies with a heartbeat while they're still in the womb is completely legal and that it happens thousands and thousands of times a year, what would they say? When they saw the violence, not only on the streets, but then they saw the violence in every form of media as a form of entertainment. When they saw violence as entertainment in our land, what would they say? When they observed the vulgarity in every form of music and television and the vulgarity that passes as common everyday language, if they listened to some conversations, they would think that some people don't know more than five words that all have four letters and just say them over and over again, repeatedly, again, and again, folks, you need to learn some English. Learn how to communicate verbally using words. What would these founding fathers say? They would be shocked, would they not? And they would wonder if the great sacrifices they had made, if the blood that they shed, if the friends that they left on the battlefield, if all that they gave up in the founding of a free nation, if it was worth it, if that's the way the nation would have turned out. Today, why, America? Well, we may be tempted to think that this is the worst that it's ever been. We are tempted to look at the state of the nation in which we live today and say, there has never been so much evil, corruption, and wickedness anywhere, at any time, in any place in the world ever. This is a completely unique experience, but it's not. No. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah lived and ministered in a day much like ours today. He ministered in the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. And that nation was one that had been greatly blessed by God. Amongst all the nations around it, Judah had been more blessed than any nation. Does that sound like us? They had been blessed with natural resources. They had been blessed with military victory. They had been blessed with industry. They had been blessed with crops that yielded 
their harvest in season. They'd been blessed again and again and again. And they began to think that they were indestructible. They forgot about God until the nation of Judah was utterly defeated by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. And the nation, the people of the nation, were sent off into exile in the land of Babylon. Jeremiah saw it all. Jeremiah was there for the blessing of God. Jeremiah saw how the heavens were open and how God so graciously had blessed the nation of Judah. And Jeremiah saw the corruption of the people. How they took the blessings for granted. He saw the collapse of the nation. And, and Jeremiah was burdened to the bone. He said in earlier chapters, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt? He remembered what God had done for His people when they were slaves in Egypt and brought them out. And then in a later chapter, Jeremiah says, They have turned their backs to me, but not their faces. They had their faces looking at God, but their backs were turned to Him. And I believe today that America is in the same situation. What I told the children is true. In God we trust is on our money. It is our national motto. We were founded, let there be no mistake, on Judeo-Christian ideals. But we have turned our backs on God. Oh yes, we still have our face toward Towards it. We want to hold on to, to some little vestige of the past and some traditions that have the seemingness of religiosity, but there's no power in it. And there's no commitment to it and no dedication. Jeremiah asked the people of Judah four hard questions in chapter 8. And I believe those four why questions be asked of America today. Question number one is, why has this people backslidden? Why has this people slidden back? In verse 5, if your Bible is still open, the Lord asked through Jeremiah, why have these people turned away? Why is Jerusalem always turning away? They take hold of deceit. And they refuse to. And we look around at the nation and the state of the nation that we live, and we, we have things that come on the commercials in television, and we have to so quickly change the channel to avert our eyes or keep our children from being corrupted. When we see all that is accepted in our land, are we shocked? Does it surprise us? Should it? We've had 50 years of moral decline. 50 years. In the last 50 years, the moral decline of the United States of America has tracked right along with the most prosperous time in all of human history. We live in the most prosperous time in all of history. The standard of living where, where we live today is greater than it has ever been before. The length of life, the extent of life, the comforts that we have are absolutely unimaginable. How many of you start having a nervous breakdown if your cell phone does not have Wi-Fi service? We live in such an unprecedented age, the age of such great comfort and so much given to us. And it is during that same 50-year period of prosperity that national morality has completely dissolved. And it repeats that way all through history. As people become more comfortable in their material world, they forget the world that is to come and the God who lives there. Amen? Why? Why have we backslidden? In verse 7, we see the religious decline. Even storks, he says, in the sky know their seasons. Turtle doves, swallows, and cranes are aware of their migration. But my people don't know the requirements of the Lord. 
The birds that fly in the air, they know when it's time to go south for the winter. They know when it's time to return home. They know when it's time to build their nest and lay their eggs and raise their young. They instinctively know these things. And yet God says about the nation of Judah, yet my people that I have called my own, they don't know the requirements of the Lord. And it can be said of us today that even amongst the church of the living God, we have over, over 200 people enrolled in this church. If we gave a poll and found out how many of them could name the Ten Commandments to quote the Lord's Prayer or the 23rd Psalm, how many would it be? And yet my people do not even know the requirements of the Lord. Verse 11, we see something that's all over the land, media deception. Yes, in the book of Jeremiah, they talk about CNN and Fox. Verse 11, they've treated the brokenness of my dear people superficially on the outside, claiming peace, peace, when there is no peace. Friends, the news media and the entertainment media in our land today cannot be trusted. Let me make everybody mad. CNN cannot be trusted. Fox News cannot be trusted. Peace. Peace. Every news outlet that is out there tells you what they want believe. Media deception. It was going on back then as well. Verse 12. They had forgotten how to blush. Verse 12. Were they ashamed when they acted so detestably? They weren't at all ashamed. They could no longer feel humiliation. Therefore they will fall among the fallen when I punish them. They will collapse, says the Lord. They didn't even know they forgot how to be humiliated. Verse 13, God judged Judah. He says, I will gather them and bring them to an end. This is the Lord's declaration. There will be no grapes on the vine, no figs on the tree, and even the leaf will wither. Whatever I have given them will be lost to them. Friends, Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, Judah was the apple of God's eye. Judah in the nation of Israel, they were God's chosen people. They were the people of the covenants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were the people who had been led by Moses out of the wilderness. They were the people who had God's temple dwelling in the city of David. And God judged them. And if God will judge his own specially chosen people, Israel, do you not think he will judge the United States of America? Why? Why has this people backslidden? Number two, why do we sit still? Verse 14, why are we just sitting here? Gather together. Let us enter the fortified cities and perish there. For the Lord our God has destroyed us. He has given us poison water to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. We sit around and we're shocked at what we see. We grumble about it in our little groups. We make sure that we don't talk about some things in front of some people and other things in front of other people. But the truth is we have sat still. And watched it all happen. We have been the proverbial frog in the kettle. If you drop a frog into a pot of hot water, the frog will immediately, with all of its ability, jump out. But if you put a frog in a kettle of room temperature water and slowly begin to warm it, degree by degree, that frog will swim around in that water until it cooks. Watched it happen. We have sat still. We just want to do our own thing. 
We, I'm talking to the church, the blood-bought, born-again, spirit-filled saints of the living God, we just want to, we don't want to get involved. We don't want to be bothered. We don't want anything to cost us anything. We don't want people to make fun of us. We don't want to be shut out from the group or the crowd or our peers. We don't want our liberty to have any cost. Friends, something that has no cost has no value. sat around and let it happen, and yet the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to every believer is, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a lamp and place it under a bowl. No, they place it on a stand for all to see. In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He said, you are the salt of the earth, the preservative of the earth. If salt loses its saltiness, wherewith shall it be salted again? It is of no use but to be cast out and trodden underfoot by men. I am afraid that American Christians and that the American church, I am afraid today that the church of Jesus Christ that worships in the comfortable pews and the comfortable churches of the United States of America have become salt that has lost its saltiness and is no longer having a preserving effect in the world in which we live. And the Lord himself has said, if we lose our saltiness, we are of no use but to be cast out and trodden under by foot. Why do we sit? Number three, why have we provoked God to anger? Verse 19, listen to the cry of my dear people from a faraway land. The Lord no longer in Zion, her king not within her. Why have they angered me? With their carved images and with their worthless foreign eyes. They have provoked Lord, their God, and the worship of idols. And we need to. We have our America. America hasn't abandoned God. We've just made him one God among the other. Maybe not statues of silver and gold. gluttonies, our sloth, all ahead of God. And let there be no mistake, they are all idols. God said, 
says, I will be first or I will not be tithe. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Why is there no trouble? Is there no balm in Gilead? Not palm, but balm. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? And why is the healing of my dear people not come up? Why is there no recovery? There used to be a hymn many years ago that there a bomb in Gilead? Yes, there's a bomb in Gilead, and we don't say the word because we don't understand the words anymore, and it just takes take too long to explain the words. And when I was a child, I remember hearing it and thinking about you know, a terrorist or something. Bomb in Gilead. But there was a place in Gilead that made meditation and was known for its healing ministry. Prophet Jeremiah said, Why? If, if there's no healing available, why? Why? Why is there no recovery of God's people? Is there an answer? Is it too late? Folks, the people of God in Jeremiah's day had waited too late. The people in Jeremiah's day reached the point of no return. The people in Jeremiah's day reached the critical mass where there was no turning back. And yet God still gave them the promise. Second Chronicles 7.14 that we quote using the National Day of Prayer it was a promise that God gave to the people of Judah specifically in their context for their day and for their time. But I believe that God would honor those words in our generation. Do you remember the words of Second Chronicles 7.14? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, then will I That promise of God was specifically given to the people of Jeremiah's day. God gave them opportunity after opportunity. They waited too late. And Nebuchadnezzar in 586 came marching in with the mighty armies of Babylon. And Judah thought that they were so strong they could never be defeated. But friends, let me tell you something. If God decrees judgment... It matters not how great is your army, air force, navy, or marines. If God decrees judgment on a nation, it will fall. Oh God. You may not be able to say that. Being realistic here, below me, below you. You may not can stop the avalanche that's already halfway down the mountain. You may not be able to turn it back. But you can change you. You can have an effect in your family. You can begin to change and affect change in your workplace in your school, among your friends and peers. You may not can turn the tide in the whole nation of America, but you can do your part where you are. You can be the light of the world. You can be the salt of the earth where you are. And it begins with you. And if you and you and you and you and then a couple million yous get together, committed to living for God and committed to 
walking in His truth and committed to being the light of the world and the salt of the earth if those millions get together. Like we saw this morning with Peter receiving believers baptism. Why? Why? Why not? Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that every one of the sound of my voice and all those watching by live stream have heard and will now respond to your word and your calling as you lead. Father, I pray this morning. Decisions will be made for your glory, for your good, for your people. And in your name. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, Will you stand as we have our hymn of invitation? Just as I am.